Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to All Souls Church Langham Place. Welcome to the 2017 John Stott London Lecture. It's great to see so many people here. It's great to see so many faces I recognize, and it's even better to see lots of faces I don't recognize. Um, just quickly, my name is Dave Bookless. I work for Arosha International, uh, and we in Arosha International are one of four partners uh, who form the London Lecture Committee and who sponsor this annual series of lectures. Uh, we work with the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, Langham Partnership, and All Souls Church here. Four organizations that John Stott took a personal interest in and supported during his life. And this year it was Arosha's turn to propose a speaker and uh, I'm delighted that we've got Professor Catherine Hayhoe, and I'll say a little bit more about her in just a second. But first, the important but boring bits. Um, if you need facilities, if you require toilets, go to that corner of the building downstairs, and the toilets are all the way along the corridor under this aisle. Um, and there's two lots of ladies' toilets, so if there's a queue at the first one, keep going down the corridor, and you'll find the others. Uh, I also need to say that should there be an alarm or any sort of emergency, it won't be a practice, it will be real. And the exits are there, I've always wanted to do this, and there, okay? And that's, that should be the way out, thank you, thank you. Now, let's see other important bits. If you have a phone on you, please make sure that it's on silent, but do feel free to use it for tweeting during the lecture. If you are a social media person, we're gonna be using hashtag JSLL, John Stott London Lecture, hashtag JSLL, if you wanna tweet during the lecture. And do please, during the interval at the end, come and browse on the tables from the various organizations here at the front. Uh, and if you wish to sign up with membership cards and so on, you can either hand those in at the door or just leave those on your chairs and they'll be picked up at the end. Final little bit before I introduce our speaker is to mention a particular book, um, Langham Ministries, Langham Partnership, which is one of the sponsors of these lectures, uh, is headed up by Chris Wright, who sadly can't be with us tonight because he's on the other side of the Atlantic. But a book has just come out, which is a sort of festschrift for Chris Wright's 70th birthday, called Breath and Bone, Living Out the Mission of God in the World. It's just out. There are plenty of copies here tonight, and they're only 10 pounds. So I've been asked to say that. And also, if we can go on to the next slide. Oh, I can do that myself. Ah, there we go. Even better. That tells you the timetable for this evening. After the lecture, we will have a very short interval Time to pop to the loo, time to grab any food if there's any left. Time if you're upstairs on the balcony to come and get a seat down here because you won't get a microphone up in the balcony if you want to ask a question. And then we're going to go into Q&A, questions and answers for about half an hour before we finish uh, by nine o'clock this evening. And the next slide, keep, whoop, keep forgetting that I've, aha, I'm in a race against Adrian up there. But. We've got the run. Next year's John Stott London Lecture, we're delighted to announce, will be here at All Souls on Thursday the 15th of November, and it will be Dr. Tim Chester, who I believe is here tonight. He's hiding. He's over there. There we are. Tim, welcome. And uh, Tim Chester is well known as a speaker, as an author of over 40 books, uh, and more about that, details of the title, and a few tasters of that will be up on the John Stott London Lecture website uh, as soon as we have them. But please do put the date in your diary for next year. Now, Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the natural environment. She's a professor and director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech University. She's lead author for the US National Climate Assessments, including the most recent one that came out just two weeks ago, and has served on panels for the National Academy of Science, 
the American Association for the Advancements of Science, and many other professional organizations. She's over 120 peer-reviewed publications in top journals in this field. But Catherine may be better known to many people because of how she's bridging the gap between scientists and particularly Christians. Together with her husband, Andrew Farley, who is both a pastor, an author, and a professor of applied linguistics, Catherine has written a book called A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions, a book that untangles the complex science and tackles the misconceptions about global warming. Her work as a climate change speaker, climate change evangelist to some, has been featured on the Emmy award-winning documentary series, Years of Living Dangerously, as well as plenty of other, if you just Google her, you'll find plenty of videos with Catherine speaking on YouTube. As a world-class climate scientist and a Christian, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe defies some of the stereotypes about the politics of religion and science. But defying stereotypes, stereotypes invites inquiry, which can lead to better communication and learning. It creates opportunity for thinking deeply about and aligning what we value and what we do. Catherine has been named as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, The Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Global Thinkers, Politico's 50 Thinkers, Doers and Visionaries, Transforming American Politics, and one of Fortune's 50 World's Greatest Leaders. So ladies and gentlemen, Catherine Hayhoe. Thank you, Dave, for that introduction. I've had the opportunity to speak in many interesting places, and this is definitely one of the best looking ones. <laughs> My most interesting location was last April. I was asked to speak at Earth Day Texas, which you may not know is the biggest Earth Day festival in the entire North America, at the end of the Science March. So myself and another scientist and the mayor of Dallas were waiting where the science march was supposed to terminate in the fairgrounds, but they never showed up. We sat there for five minutes, for 10 minutes. There were some penguins on stage and a tiger, but there was no science march. There was us, about 10 parents, and about 30 children. About 15 minutes later, a golf cart rocketed into the band shell with a frantic looking man in it who said, get in, get in the cart, we've lost the science march. <laughs> so he loaded up us two scientists and the mayor of Dallas and off we went, picking up Sylvia Earle, the famous oceanographer, and the ambassador from Fiji along the way. <laughs> Not a joke, the ambassador from Fiji had an orchid in her hair. We picked up a few other dignitaries, so we had a train of golf carts going through fair buildings looking for the science march because they had lost it. They never found the science march. It had dissipated across the giant fairgrounds. So then they decided, well, we have to find you a stage because by this time they had about 10 speakers lined up in the golf carts. So they went around trying to find a stage and the stage they found was a one meter wide, thin strip of blue astroturf perched precariously over a tank in which people were scuba diving. <laughs> Sylvia Earle felt right at home. The rest of us were a little nervous. So up until the, now, that has been my most unusual location, but today as I was sitting there looking up, I realized my slides are replacing Jesus's head. <laughs> And at first I thought, that seems a little sacrilegious. But then I thought more about what we're going to be talking about tonight, and I thought, well, actually, I think this might be really appropriate. Because what I'm going to explore tonight is the synergy between what our world is telling us, what this planet that we live on is telling us when we study it as a scientist, and what our faith and what the Bible is telling us when we look at what God has written to us in words. So often we see these two as being in conflict, but in reality, think of it this way. 
If you believe that God created this universe in which we live and this planet that we call our home, then what is science other than trying to figure out how God did it? And sometimes our preconceived notions get in the way. We have some very narrow views of how God might or might not be permitted to have done it. But with a little humility and a little patience, often we can work some of these things out. Sometimes they take longer than our lifetime. But there should not be any inconsistency. One of the most frequent questions that I am asked is, do you believe in global warming? In that tone. With the expectation that I will say, of course I believe in it. The problem is, as one US politician said, and I should hasten to point out that this politician actually supports the idea that climate is changing, humans are responsible, and we should do something about it. He said, the problem is that Al Gore has turned this thing into a religion. And for proof, you have to look no further than the internet, where you will find cartoons like this. And if you have very good eyesight, you will notice that someone has actually photoshopped my head onto the choir. <laughs> But the reality is, is when I'm asked, do you believe in climate change or global warming, my answer to that is no. I don't. Because if you look to the Bible for the definition of faith or belief, the definition comes from a famous chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, which talks about what faith is. And it begins by saying, now faith is the substance of things that are hoped for. In other words, they are not presently here, the evidence of things that we do not see. And if I had been there back when the author of Hebrews was writing this, I would have jogged their elbow and I would have said, you forgot the second half of the verse, because the second half is clearly science is the substance of things here and now, the evidence of things that we can observe, right? Even if you go to Google, the arbiter of modern day knowledge, did you know that our brains are storing less information now than they used to because of Google? If you go to Google, Google defines science as the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and through experiment. And it defines faith as a strong belief that is based on spiritual apprehension rather than truth. They are very different, and I recognize that some have certainly tried their best to turn science into a religion, and others have done their best to try to force people to choose between science and religion. But the reality is, as one man said, that scientists do not demand belief. We don't join hands every Sunday singing, yes, gravity is real, I will believe. <laughs> and whether this horse believed in gravity or not, makes no difference. You step off the cliff, you are going down. I should also note that the man who owned the Segways, you know Segways, those things on two wheels, he also went off a cliff on his Segway. But I didn't want to show that picture. I don't think there is a picture, thank goodness. Faith and science are not in competition. They're not two alternate systems of belief that are mutually exclusive. I would venture to say, one more thing, not only are they not mutually exclusive, but when it comes to wicked, bad problems, like climate change, where science can inform our decisions, but science cannot determine our decisions. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that science cannot tell us definitively. We need more than science. We need what is in our hearts. And for many of us, for 85% of us around the world, what is in our hearts is often written by our faith. And for 100% of us around the world, what is in our hearts is often written by our humanity. Because regardless of who we are or what we believe, we will do things for other people that are altruistic to our own detriment. We feel sympathy, we feel compassion for others because that is who we are. And some of that, much of that, cannot be explained by naked self-interest, certainly not, or by science. So what can science tell us? Let's start with the science part. What can science tell us? Often when we look at our planet, we imagine it as this pristine, untouched globe where all you see are the forests, the deserts, the ocean, the ice sheets. 
But today, a more accurate way to look at our planet, I believe, is not the way it looks during the daytime, but rather the way it looks, oops, there we go, at night. Because... Over the last few hundred years, our population has skyrocketed. We are at nearly seven and a half billion people. And so while some people still say, how on earth could somebody as small as a human affect the climate of the planet? My answer is 7.5 billion people can certainly affect the planet. All you have to do is get in an airplane and look at the planet. You can see us. And if you zoom in on the UK, there you go, there's the UK and France. You can see specific cities. You can see the giant glow down there that is London. And if you zoom in even further on London, you can even see the individual streets. And if you're very good at geography, you could probably pinpoint where we are. A few people say yes, yes. <laughs> we are so numerous that we are certainly capable of having an impact on our planet. How are we achieving these lights? Since the dawn of the industrial era, our society has been powered. It's been powered by fossil fuels. And these fossil fuels, initially coal, now weaning ourselves off coal, natural gas and oil, make no mistake, these fossil fuels have brought us enormous benefits. Many of us would not be sitting here today if it were not for the benefits that those fossil fuels have brought us. Cast your mind back, if you know anything about history other than Downton Abbey. Cast your mind back. <laughs> that was a very pleasant life. I think many of us would take that life. But cast your mind back to what life was really like for many people a few hundred years ago. For all too many people, it was short, it was brutal, and it was painful. It was endless drudgery, often early death from diseases that nobody would die from today. But wait, people still do in certain countries. It was not really that pleasant a time to live. In fact, I'm willing to bet that if I had been born back then, I probably wouldn't have survived past my first or second birthday. The dawn of the industrial era occurred right at this inflection point. What is the reason that our population, which had been slowly and steadily increasing for many hundreds of years, what is the reason that it was able to increase exponentially? It was because we were able to replace human labor with mechanized labor. And it's brought us many benefits. Refrigerators. Imagine if you not just had to go to the market every day, imagine if you had to actually go find your food every day. How much of your time would that take? It has completely changed our work and our social patterns. If you have to rise with the sun and go to sleep with the sun, you have a very different life. We are sitting here long after sunset. It has changed our transportation habits massively. This is a car, but trains, airplanes, and ships belong here too. And most importantly, it has changed our medical resources and our medical technology. Fossil fuels have brought us enormous advantages. And so when we look at figures like this that show how many people in the world live without electricity and without cooking facilities, often we say, well, the fair, the just, the humane, the compassionate thing is to make sure that they get all of the access to fossil fuels that we had because clearly that's the way to do it. And so there are many in the Christian community who argue that there is a moral case for fossil fuels because there is no question that fossil fuels have brought us substantial benefits. And to deny those benefits to others is unfair. It absolutely is. But there are at least three reasons why fossil fuels will not help the more than billion people who live without the resources that we do on this map. This is the Texas version of the Bible. It's published on road signs. We look at verses like loving our neighbor. We think of our neighbors right here in London or the place where we live or on the other side of the world and we want the best for them. That is what we want because that is the type of people that we are. We want the best for them. But in this day and age, there are three reasons why fossil fuel resources are not the best for them. Number one is they don't have them. 
This is a map just showing you where the coal deposits are in the world. Where are they? Do you remember the previous map where the most people live without energy? It's pretty much exactly the opposite, isn't it? In fact, if you look at all the coal and gas and oil reserves in the world, Africa has 6%, most of the, that in Nigeria. So telling those countries that have many people who do not have access to, to energy the way we do, telling them you have to use fossil fuels is saying you have to become indebted to the already rich countries who will sell you their resources and who will build the grid for you that you do not have at your expense and who will help you to do things exactly the way we did them a hundred years ago. It's like saying, oh, well, you know, you don't deserve the cell phone yet. You only get the party line telephone. Come back in 50 years. It is the most patronizing colonialistic attitude I have seen as somebody who grew up part of their time in Canada and part of their time in Colombia. That's one reason why fossil fuels are not the answer. Simple logic, it, they don't have them. Reason number two, we know that extraction and consumption of fossil fuels have immediate negative impacts on not only the local environment, but the people who live in it. In the United States, in the Appalachians, one of the cheapest ways to get coal, this is a picture of the Appalachians, one of the cheapest ways to get coal is to literally cut the top off the mountains. The coal industry gives people jobs in that area that they wouldn't have otherwise, but it also gives them some other things. As my friend Marianne wrote, mountaintop removal coal mining poisons the waterways. It's allowing heavy metals and toxins to invade their local water supplies, and so residents have higher incidence of cancer, heart disease, kidney disease, birth defects, and premature mortality. That is a heavy price to pay. We know that air pollution pervades so many of our cities. But what we often don't realize is the impact that air pollution has because we've lived with it for so long. Did you know that the very first air quality legislation in the entire world was put into place in London? Yep. In the 1200s, it was declared, yep, the 1200s, it was declared illegal to burn coal within the city limits because of the terrible fog and smog that it produced, and the penalty was death. <laughs> Air pollution kills 5 million people every year. About half of that is from indoor air pollution, from not having adequate cooking facilities. And the other half is outdoor air pollution, typically from vehicles and factories. Poor people, no matter where we are, poor people tend to only be able to afford to live in more polluted environments. And so people who live in more polluted, less desirable neighborhoods tend to breathe in more pollutants and more particulates. There is an aspect to this that is profoundly unfair, again. That's the second reason why fossil fuels are not the answer to solving poverty. The third answer, though, lies in this picture but it lies in something that you can't see. It's not the steam, the water vapor, and the particulates coming out of the smokestack. It is the invisible heat-trapping gases that you cannot see. That is the third reason why fossil fuels are not the answer. We know how much coal and oil and gas we've been using over the last few hundred years because you buy it, you sell it, you write it down. So we know, when you burn this stuff, how much carbon it produces. The last two years, our carbon emissions were starting to level off in 2014 and 2015, but in 2016, they ticked upwards again. Why do we care about an invisible, odorless gas? We can't see it. We can't smell it. It's only present in the atmosphere in 410 parts per million, so in other words, if you have a million parts of air, only 410 of them are carbon dioxide today, that doesn't sound so serious, does it? Well, I'll give you a glass of water, and out of the million particles in the glass of water, 400 of them will be arsenic. How do you feel about that? Would you drink it? Probably not. 
It isn't the amount that matters, it's the potency. And here's why the potency of carbon dioxide matters. It matters because our planet, that's our happy planet, has a natural blanket of heat-trapping gases. The sun's energy shines down on the Earth, and to a large extent, it goes through that blanket. It's transparent to much of the sun's energy. The Earth heats up and gives off heat energy, and that blanket traps the Earth's heat energy just like a blanket traps our body heat on a cold night. So if we didn't have this blanket, our planet would be a frozen ball of ice. It keeps us more than 30 degrees Celsius warmer than we would be otherwise. There would be no life on this planet without the natural blanket. So you might say, so what's the problem then? CO2 is good, right? When we dig up coal and oil and gas and burn it, we are wrapping an extra blanket around our planet, an extra blanket that it did not need. Like when I used to stay at my grandma's house when I was little, she would sneak in every night and put an extra blanket on me. And I would wake up sweating saying, Grandma, I didn't need that blanket. That's what we're doing to our planet. That's why it matters. Now, even though this science is so simple and so clear, you just saw a one-minute cartoon explains the basic science. Even still, there are many but what about questions, and we hear them all the time. We pick up the newspaper, we read them, we turn on the television, we hear somebody saying them, we go to our favorite website or blog, we hear people, we see people writing about them. There's many questions, and I'm going to address just a couple of the most frequent ones. And between the month of November and about April, the most frequent question is, It is cold outside. Where is global warming now? We have to understand there's a profound difference between weather and climate. Weather is like a single tree. It's the conditions in a certain place at a certain time. Climate is like the forest. It is the long-term average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. So can we still have a cold day when the planet is warming? Yes, it's called winter. But over climate time scales, winter is getting warmer. Will we still have seasons? Yes, we still will, because seasons are caused by the orbit of the Earth around the sun. We will still have winter and summer and spring and fall, but winter will be warmer, summer will be hotter, and spring and fall might be look more like summer does today. Saying that it's cold where I am at this time, therefore climate can't be changing, is like saying, well, my end of the Titanic just went 200 feet up in the air, so clearly it can't be sinking. We have to look at the big picture. And that's why it's so important to look at global average temperature measured by tens of thousands of thermometers around the world. And when we look at global average temperature, we see that that doesn't really look like it's going up, does it? But what, how long of a time period are we looking at there? Only about 10 years. Is that climate? Pop quiz. No. Climate is the long-term average over at least 20 to 30 years. Why that time period? Because over shorter time periods, we know that natural cycles that exchange heat between the ocean and the atmosphere can cause temperature change to increase or decrease by altering the balance of heat. When we add all of the rest of the data in there, and look at this, there you go, there's the rest of the data, we see that clearly over climate time scales, it is getting warmer. You can have a year or two or even a few that are a bit cooler, but decade by decade, global temperature continues to march up. It isn't just thermometers. Some people say, oh, well, you know, those scientists, they're always manipulating the data. They're just making it say whatever they want it to say. So I say, all right, let's throw out every single thermometer in the world, even the central England record that goes back to 1658. Let's throw all of them out. Let's go ahead and throw out the satellite observations. Let's throw out the ocean buoys. Let's throw out every piece of scientific data and let us only look at what is happening in God's creation that we can see with our own eyes. When we go up to the Arctic, we see that previously frozen ground is crumbling and thawing. When we go to Japan, we see that the cherry trees 
are flowering now several weeks earlier than they have in the 1,100-year record they have kept of when the cherry tree festival is kept in Kyoto, Japan. When we go to many places around the world, Central Asia, Southern United States, East Asia, we see that heavy rainfall is becoming much more frequent. And if you've ever, whoopsie, we're missing a figure there. This is a glacier that's completely melted, clearly. <laughs> I was going to say, if you've ever had the opportunity to go to Switzerland, France, up into Scandinavia, or over to North America, up in the Northwest Territories, or the Yukon, or Alaska, if you've ever had an opportunity to go to any of those places, you know that when you go to see a glacier, there will be often these markers showing where the glacier used to be. And sometimes when you stand at the marker that says 1995, you can't even see where the glacier is. In Switzerland, there is a glacier that during the, the relatively tiny little cold period called the Little Ice Age in Europe, and it was just a regional effect, and it was part of natural variability as well as some volcanic eruptions. During the Little Ice Age, a glacier was growing so fast that it was threatening to overwhelm a Swiss village. And so they went to the Pope and they asked for a special prayer to be said to keep the glacier from overwhelming their village. Back then, the Pope gave them that prayer, and they have said it every year until a few years ago when they went back to the Pope and they asked for a different prayer. The glacier had receded so far up the valley they could barely see it anymore, and they were concerned about their water supply running out. It isn't just one glacier, though. If it's just one glacier, that wouldn't be enough. But when we look all around the entire world, almost every single glacier is receding, and the few that are advancing are ones where it's actually snowing more because in a warmer climate, the rainfall patterns change and the snow patterns change, and so there are a couple that are even advancing. But the vast majority, thousands of them, are retreating. When we look around the entire planet, there are over 26,500 indicators of a warming world. We don't need thermometers, satellites, and ocean buoys to tell us that. The most common but what about question I get about the science is, but isn't it just a natural cycle or the sun? Now, we would be very poor scientists if we immediately, when we saw the planet was warming, we immediately jumped to the conclusion that it was humans. It's like going to the doctor with you know, a fever and some aches, and the doctor just takes one look at you and says, Ebola. That's not a very responsible thing to do. You want to see if they have the flu or food poisoning, and then you advance to some more serious but well-known things like leukemia. You don't just jump to the Ebola diagnosis immediately. In the same way as climate scientists, we don't immediately just jump on the fact that this is human. We say, we are going to look at every single possible natural explanation for why climate has changed in the past, because we all know it's changed in the past, because whether we want to admit it or not, we have probably seen an Ice Age movie. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. We know climate has changed in the past. And so we have to look at every single natural cause first to see if it could explain the warming, right? So that's what we do. We look, for example, at the sun, because that's where we get all our energy from. Now, this is our Earth's temperature from 1900 until now. The squiggly line is year to year, and the thicker line just shows you the long-term climate trend. If we were getting warmer because of the sun, does that mean the sun's energy would be going up or going down? Up. Correct. So let's look at the sun's energy. It was going up in the early part of the century, and though I have scaled it so you can see it here, when you actually translate that increase into temperature, it's about this big on the figure. This big. Over the last 40 years, it peaked and it started to go down. So our temperature is going up and the sun's energy is going down. If we were being controlled primarily by the sun right now, we would be getting cooler, not warmer. What about the Ice Age cycles? Aren't we just getting warmer after the last Ice Age? We warmed substantially after the last Ice Age, but the, last, the warming after the last Ice Age actually peaked several thousand years ago. And if you look at the history of human civilization on this planet, if you look at the last few thousand years when we have built our cities and cut down our forests and planted our fields and built our 
roads and bridges and train lines and airports, water treatment plants, homes. If you look at that period of time, our temperature has been remarkably stable but on a very slow decline. Why is that? Because according to orbital cycles right now, we should be heading into the next ice age. That's not a good thing. I'm from Canada. Canada was under a mile of ice during the last ice age. We don't want another ice age. We like it just right. And if you'll notice something, you'll see that we were starting to plateau a little bit through the development of agriculture and deforestation. We were starting to actually exert an influence on climate before the Industrial Revolution. And it would have been, if we had continued, it would have been just enough to stabilize climate and stave off the Ice Age. But, of course, we're never content with just a little bit. We want a lot. And so, right about when carbon dioxide skyrocketed up, you can see carbon dioxide increasing slightly, and that's the development of agriculture there. Right when it skyrocketed was right when our temperature went straight up too. We should be heading into the next ice age sometime in the next 1,500 years. But we are not. In fact, we have indefinitely delayed the next ice age. And we haven't just delayed it. We are heading into unknown territory. We are heading into a territory that ha we as humans have never lived through. It can't be the sun and it can't be natural cycles. They have an alibi. We should be cooling and we're not. I was the author, a lead author, on a recent U.S. federal government report. Yes, you heard that right. A U.S. federal government report on the science of climate change, which is currently the most up-to-date assessment of the state of climate science in the world. If you want to find it, it's online. That's what the website looks like. It's really good reading. Okay, it's a little dry. I admit. But it has key findings that you can read in the headlines. You can skip the rest if you want. On the other hand, if you have tr trouble sleeping, I highly recommend it. But I'm going to give you one highlight, and that is that it concludes the likely range of the human contribution to global mean temperature is between 92 and one, 123% of the observed change. How could it be over 100%? Because we should be cooling. So, so we should be doing this, and the observed warming is taking us up to zero and then pushing us up to here. And we go on to say there are no convincing alternative explanations. Every single one of those, cosmic rays, El Nino, volcanoes, we have looked at them, we have tested them, and they cannot explain the warming. Not only that, but the science I just shared with you, we have known for a really long time. You know how long we've known about the blanket that we have around our planet that keeps us 30 degrees warmer than we should be? Since Fourier in the 1820s. Do you know how long we have realized that humans were wrapping an extra blanket around the planet through extracting and burning fossil fuels? Since Joseph Tyndale in 1856. And at the same time he was doing that, an American woman called Eunice Foote, who I cannot find a picture of and I have tried, she was doing the same thing. She presented a paper at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in the 1850s showing that carbon dioxide was a heat-trapping gas, and she even speculated what our planet would look like if carbon dioxide levels were much less or much greater than today. I'm presenting at that same meeting in February. That's over 160 years between us. And then Arrhenius, a Swedish chemist, in between winning a Nobel Prize for Physical Chemistry on the weekends, decided to build the first climate model by hand. It took him two years to calculate how much the world would warm if we doubled or tripled carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and how much faster the Arctic would warm than the rest of the world. And his numbers were pretty much dead on. Now, after about the first year, his wife packed up the family and left. So sometimes you can have too much of a good thing. But his contributions were amazing and they were humbling. And then lastly, Guy Callender, a British engineer, in his spare time, in between doing top secret war work, he wrote to people around the world and collected temperature data and created the first global average temperature record and showed that yes, indeed, it was going up. And in his paper, which you can still read if you Google it today, Google, it says, in effect, I love his paper, he says, you're probably not going to believe what I have to say, 
But I will attempt to prove through data and analysis that the world is warming due to increasing levels of carbonic acid in the atmosphere, which is what they called carbon dioxide. So this is really, really old science. But then the question starts to be, well, OK, so if the world is warming, if humans are responsible, we're only talking about a few degrees. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? If you look at opinion maps in the United States, we often focus on a map of how many people agree with the science that climate is changing and humans are responsible. And on this map, everything that's blue is less than 50%, and everything that's orange is greater than 50%, and the darker the color, the more it is towards the, the edges. We often fixate on this, and we think, well, we have to just convince everybody the science is real. Well, these same people at Yale who conducted this survey, they asked a different question. They asked, do you think this matters to you personally? Look at this. The real problem is not who all agrees with the science or not. The real problem is we don't care. That's the problem. So you're starting to see it isn't all about what's up here. There are plenty of people who have all their facts straight up here, yet somehow it has completely, completely missed their hearts. And that's most of us. Science is not all we need. We need more because science cannot make us care. In fact, sometimes overwhelming people with science actually makes us disassociate because we can't deal with the anxiety and the stress of this massive global issue that we feel like we can't do anything to fix. It doesn't help that the most frequently used image of global warming is an animal that almost nobody has seen in its natural habitat. Today at lunch, I asked a group of us, has anybody actually seen a live polar bear in the wild? And one other person besides me put up their hand. I'm going to do it here tonight because we have a much bigger sample. All right, live polar bear in the wild, anybody. That is my son there. <laughs> he was with me. And you have too. All right. Oh, we got another one up there. Four. Four of us, two of us together, have actually seen a live polar bear. If this is the only reason that we have to fix climate change, seriously? Why do we bother with the Paris Agreement? Why do we bother with changing our entire energy system? Why don't we just buy the whole Northwest Territories in Canada, because who cares anyways, and turn it into a giant polar bear park? You could even breed seals for them. It would not be that expensive. The reality, though, is that we care about, yes, <laughs> we care about a changing climate because after the polar bear, we're next. We are exceedingly vulnerable to a changing climate. Why? Well, two thirds of the world's biggest cities are within about a meter of sea level, and sea level will likely rise at least a meter this century. You cannot pick up Shanghai or New York or Houston and move them. That is a lot more expensive than turning the northern half of Canada into a polar bear park. Every acre of arable land is allotted and farmed, and if you can't grow cotton on your land anymore, you can't exactly move up to Kansas and take over somebody's land. It's already owned. We care about a changing climate, whether we live in Canada or India, because it affects us. It is increasing the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation. It is making droughts that already occur naturally longer and stronger in Texas and in Syria. It is thawing what used to be permanently frozen ground where over 200 Native American villages currently stand. They're trying to evacuate, but they have no support to do so. It is exacerbating coastal storms like Hurricane Sandy that devastated Long Island. And it's intensifying massive heat waves, like the one that we, you here experienced this June, the one that occurred in 2003 as well that was responsible for over 70,000 deaths, ones that occur in India and Australia. We care about a changing climate because it affects us. And boy, this year did that message come home. Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. Hurricane Irma hit Florida and the Caribbean. Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, and millions of people in Puerto Rico today are still without power. 
It's estimated that re to repair the damaged infrastructure in Puerto Rico will be equivalent to their annual GDP. We know that as the world gets warmer, hurricanes are intensifying faster, they're getting stronger on average, and they have more rainfall associated with them. While I was teaching my class on climate impacts a few weeks ago, my father texted me in the middle of class and said that my cousin's home had just burned down. They live in California, they were evacuated at 5 a.m., and by that afternoon, their home was gone. There have been wildfire seasons across the U.S. like none seen before. We don't see any more frequent wildfires. They're mostly humid ignition, a little bit of lightning. But when we get a fire in the U.S. and in Canada, it is burning longer and is burning larger areas than it has before because it is hotter and often it is drier also. As the Prime Minister of Dominica said when he spoke to the United Nations just a week or two after his island was hit by the hurricane, he said, to deny climate change is to deny a truth that we have just lived. He lives about as far from the polar bears as you can imagine. Yet he is being impacted just as much. Science can tell us also who's produced all of this carbon that's wrapping this extra blanket around the planet. And now look carefully at this and do not blink, all right? It can also tell us that the people who bear the impacts are completely disproportionate to the responsibility. We care about a changing climate because it exacerbates the risks we already face in the places where we live. And we also care about it because it affects all of us, especially the poor and the vulnerable and those who do not have a voice already today. So this is where we start to see why we need more than the science. Because when we respond to what we're seeing here, we aren't just responding with our heads, are we? We're thinking of things. And we might be thinking of, for example, how it says in Genesis, that we've been made responsible for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. We often think of that in terms of stewardship. If we were in charge of land, keeping it prosperous rather than letting it fall into decay and rack and ruin. But today, there's more than just the simple concept of stewardship. Today, we have an issue where not just the home that we have, but every living thing on this home is being affected. And we have to ask ourselves, how can the love of God remain in us if we see others in need and we refuse them our compassion? These are the thoughts that come into my head when I start to see those figures, those paired maps. Why do I care about climate change? I care about it because it exacerbates issues of hunger and food shortages among people who are already plagued by them today. I care about climate change because it exacerbates pollution of water and water shortages that already exist today. I care about it because it exacerbates diseases that nobody should be dying from in 2017. But they are today, and more and more will be in the future, because if we think of these issues as we're trying to pour all of our effort, all of our money, all of our time, all of our thoughts and prayers, we're trying to pour everything we have into a bucket to fix terrible, terrible problems that are actually killing people today. And we might say, well, I'll deal with climate change later. We have to fix this now. I will deal with climate change later. What we have to realize is that climate change is putting holes in our bucket. And those holes are getting more and more frequent over time. And eventually, we will not be able to fix hunger. We will not be able to fix malaria. We will not be able to fix the millions of deaths that occur due to polluted water. We will not be able to fix these things if we don't fix climate change. Because I care about it because it is exacerbating all of the other issues that we already face today. I don't think climate change should be number one or number two or number three on our priority list. I don't think it should be on our priority list at all. I care about climate change because it affects everything that is already on my priority list today. So when we hear scientists talk about climate change, and this was um, the past last president's science advisor, John Holdren, we, we're starting to see even scientists use very unusual words. We basically have three choices, John Holdren said. We have mitigation, reducing our carbon emissions. We have adaptation, building resilience to a changing climate. And we have suffering. 
That is not a word that scientists often say. Yet it is a word that we are intimately familiar with as humans. We're going to do some of each. The question is simply what the mix is going to be. How do we know what's the limit on this blanket that we're wrapping around the planet? I was fortunate enough to go to Paris almost two years ago now. I know several of you were too. Where the world came together to try to decide what is dangerous? What is dangerous? Is three degrees dangerous? Is two degrees dangerous? Is one and a half degrees dangerous? There are people today, and there are many others, many other species today that don't have a voice, who would say, if they were asked and could speak, they would say, it's dangerous right now. Is two degrees a magic number? Does it mean, you know, if we get to 1.999, but then we don't go over two, we're going to be safe? No. The best analogy I have for how much is dangerous is not a science analogy. It's the fact that we know smoking is dangerous, but there is no magic number of cigarettes that will ensure we have no damage. If you knew that you could smoke 9,999 cigarettes and you'd be totally fine, but if you smoked that last one, you'd get lung cancer, how many people would smoke that 9,999 cigarettes? I probably would. Why not, right? But we know it doesn't work that way. We know every additional pack of cigarettes we smoke increases our risk. Every additional gigaton of carbon we produce increases our risk. Science cannot tell us what the perfect threshold is. Science can inform that through saying, at one, at one and a half, at two degrees, here is what will happen. But the decision on what is dangerous is not made here, it is made here. And that is why it is so important to unite our head and our heart on this issue. So what is in our hearts? In my heart, again, I look to what I believe. And just putting together a couple of phrases here, patching them together, I think that this reflects very much on, on what I feel about caring about climate change. I've, we know in Romans, Paul starts off by saying, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And then Paul goes on in Ephesians to say, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And so you, being rooted and grounded in love, so what's coming first? God's love is being poured out on us. We are being rooted and grounded in love. What is the third step? The third step is to do as we have purposed, where, in our head? No, in our heart. To do as we have purposed in our heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, this is usually used to talk about money, but you know what? There is something we have that's a lot more valuable than money. Time. You can never get it back. You can be the richest person in the world. You could certainly pay for medical advances, but you cannot recover a second of your time that you have spent. So this is why I do what I do, because I feel that given the love of God that has been poured out on us, given the fact that we are rooted and grounded in that love, it is an expression of that love to do what my heart tells me to do, cheerfully, because that's who we are. So last question. What can we do about this thing? What can we do? Because I know it looks bleak. Trust me, I live in Texas. I live in Texas, which is the most conservative part of a country that over the last 25 years has gone from being fairly respectably bipartisan. The blue and the red is pretty close together, and I always get confused on those because, of course, you know, in Canada it's the opposite. Red is liberal, blue is conservative, right? But the blue and the red were pretty close together, yet over time, society has become increasingly polarized, and even worse, if you look at the people who are politically active, it looks like this. We are dealing with this incredibly politically polarized society to where today the number one predictor of what you think on issue A is just making sure it's exactly the opposite of what the other group says. Every group, each group thinks the other group does it, not them, but we all do it. And so today the number one predictor in the United States of whether you think climate is changing and humans are responsible is not how much science education you have, it's simply where you fall on the political spectrum. That is the number one predictor. And a survey done just before the last election illustrated this in spades. 
Is climate change mostly human, mostly natural, or not happening? Your answer depended on who you voted for. Now you say, okay, this is just, you know, the whole political polarization of global warming. What if you ask a simpler question? I mean, everybody knows Arctic sea ice is going down, right? I mean, you can see that with your own eyes. You can look at the satellite observations yourself, or you can even go up to the Arctic, right? Everybody knows that. Well, uh, you can ask people, do you think Arctic sea ice in the summer is less now than 30 years ago? And your answer depends on who you vote for again. Yes. You can ask people, does recent extreme weather, and this is asking people living in the US, does recent extreme weather add to the evidence for climate change? If people self-identify as liberal or moderately liberal, between 80 to 90% of people would say yes. You want to see the rest of the figure? <laughs> Moderates are 50-50. Conservatives are about 25 to 35% which is good, it's not zero. What is going on here? There is fear. There is fear of the impacts of a changing climate, but there is fear of losing my identity. I have had people say to me, and you may have had similar experiences myself, to yourself, I cannot talk to my friends about my concerns about climate change and my desire for climate action because if I did, they would reject me. We are bound by fear that somehow our community will reject us. When I wrote my book with my husband and first published it, I was concerned. I was, I was, I was a bit scared. I really was. Because given this polarized environment in which we lived, telling my fellow scientists that I was a Christian, I was afraid they would assume I had checked my brain at the door. I was worried that all of the work, all of the effort I put into building my expertise, building my research, building my science, I was afraid that I might be flushing it down the toilet. So we published the book together, and what happened? I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of fellow scientists who have criticized me for telling people that I'm a Christian. I would need all my fingers and toes and then some to number the number of colleagues who have said to me, I don't share your beliefs, but I completely support what you're doing. How can I share more from my heart about why I care? But if I piled up every single email or nasty comment I have received on social media, printed double-sided, that pile of nasty comments that I have received from people who are Christians, who call themselves Christians, I should say, people who specifically say in their email that you are a handmaiden of the beast or that um, they are a Christian but you are not, that pile would reach up to the balcony. So believe me, I know what it feels like to be attacked and rejected by people who you think are your brothers and sisters. But that is not who we are called to be. And this is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. I know it's nothing to do with, you know, Christianity or, or the creation or sustainability or being green or anything like that. No. But I think this verse is key for all of us. God has not given us the spirit of fear. So if we feel that spirit of fear, it is not from God. What we get from God is a spirit of power to act, a spirit of love to have compassion for others, and my favorite as a scientist a sound mind. So with our power to act, with our love, with our sound mind, what can we do? Well, you thought this map was bad. This was the number of people who think it matters to them, right? You thought this map was bad. I have one worse map to show you. And this map is of what is the best thing that we can do. They ask people, how often do you talk about it or do you even hear somebody talking about it? Look at that. Why don't we talk about it? We don't talk about it because we're afraid it might look like this. Or it just might look like Calvin going to sleep. So how can we talk about issues like this? How can we talk about it? I would venture to say we can talk about it, first of all, by bonding over what we genuinely share and have in common, by connecting the dots, to a changing climate, 
At that point, if we have to do any explaining, that's when we could do some explaining. But ending by talking about how we can work together to fix this thing. Because fear paralyzes. Hope is what we need for long-term sustained action. What does this look like? What could you bond over? You'd be surprised. Fishing. Skiing. Our kids. The Rotary Club. I'm not a Rotarian, but I gave a talk at our local Rotary Club a couple of years ago, and as I walked in, I saw this big banner with the four-way test. And I looked at it and I thought, that's climate change. Is it the truth? Yes. Is it fair? No. Would it build goodwill and better friendships to address it? Oh, yes. Would it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes, it would if we could fix this thing. So I took my presentation and I quickly rearranged it, put in four title slides. I went through the four-way test to a group of skeptical businessmen in West Texas. And at the end of them, one banker, everybody applauded, and one banker came up to me and he came up to me with this look on his face like, he said, you know, I'm not really on board with this whole climate change thing, but it passed the four-way test. <laughs> you know, and he was clearly saying, well, what can I do? I have to support climate action because his value system was the four-way test. I don't believe that anybody needs new values. If you are a Rotarian, if you are a parent, if you are a person of faith, if you are a human living on this planet anywhere, and this is a picture of where I live, that is literally what the backyard looks like. If you are a human living on this planet, you have all the values you need to care about a changing climate. All we have to do is figure out what those are and connect the dots. Let me share with you from my heart why I, as a mother, care passionately about the future of my child in a world that is rapidly being disturbed and disrupted by a changing climate. Let me share with you why I, as a Christian, feel that we have responsibility not just to care for the planet, but to love and care for other people as well. Let me share with you how the four-way test of the Road Herring Club <laughs> tells us that, yes, this thing is real. We can connect the dots on nearly everybody. We don't have to instill new values. We just have to spend some time getting to know each other and figuring out what makes us tick. At that point, we can explain. It's real, it's us, scientists agree. How it affects us, where we live, what's happening in the places where we live, what are the impacts that we're seeing around the world that matter to us, that matter to people we know. Wherever we live, we have these impacts. But then lastly, we have to talk about how we can work together to fix this, because if we talk about a giant problem and we don't talk about how we can fix it, what are we going to do? We're going to just disassociate. That's our defense mechanism, because I don't know about you, but I can't survive by just being overwhelmed by this enormous problem that we can never fix. The best thing to do is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, right? We have to talk about how we can work together in ways that are compatible with our values to fix this thing, because solutions are what change minds. What type of solutions? A church that works together to provide its roof as a solar garden to the community, because it's a lot cheaper to put a, one giant set of panels on than to put a tiny set on each house. What a witness to the community. An online community called Climate Caretakers, which every month sends people a list of what they can do that month. We feel that we're not doing that, you know, we're, I'm just one person, what difference can I make? Well, what if you're part of a community and we're all doing this together? Feel free to write this down and sign up if you're interested. Organizations like Young Evangelicals for Climate Action and Citizens for Public Justice, they went to Bonn last week. They were there. Personally, we can do things too. I have these little YouTube videos, these global weirding videos, and one of them is, I'm just one person, what can I do? We can take personal actions, and then what do we do with those personal actions? We talk about them. I love talking about my plug-in car, and people love hearing about it. They want to know how many miles per gallon I get and where they can get one too. I'm not lecturing them about the science of climate change. I'm talking about how awesome the solutions are. We can measure our carbon footprint to figure out where it comes from, depends on our lifestyle. We can eat lower down the food chain 
because beef produces a lot of heat trapping gases, chicken and pork produce less, fish produce less than that, vegetables less than that. We can make choices in our lives that help with our health, with our diet, and with climate change at the same time. We can talk about cool technology. I was just at a meeting with some people from MIT who said, get this, they said that in 30 years, 95% of the entire population, and yes, that includes the United States, 95% of people will not own cars because there will be a fleet of automated vehicles everywhere. Now, depending on who you are, you may be scared by that or excited. If you're excited, you can talk about it. I love the fact that you don't even have to get panels anymore. You can get shingles. You can get solar shingles for your roof. We can talk about what's happening in Texas where shiny white wind turbines are replacing rusting oil rigs. And when I went to visit a farmer in a very conservative part of the state to talk to him about drought and things like that, I noticed that his neighbor didn't had wind turbines, and he didn't. He just had a couple of old oil rigs. So after we got to know each other and, and realized that I knew somebody who went to his church and he knew somebody who went to my church, and after we'd eaten lunch together and the fried chicken was very good, I gathered up my courage and I said, I noticed that you don't have any wind turbines, but your neighbor does. Is there a reason for that? And he was, you know, he was not on board with the idea that climate was changing and humans are responsible. So I expected something along the lines of, you know, green tree huggers, communists, <laughs> antichrist. Not making that up. I get that in emails. So I asked him this and he said, yes. I said, ooh, what is it? And he said, well, I've been waiting two years for my wind turbines. My neighbor signed up ahead of me. <laughs> I said, well, why do you want them? He said, well, because the check arrives in the mail. 12% of our energy in Texas came from wind last year. The first quarter of this year, 23% came from wind. Fort Hood, the biggest army base in Texas, just went with wind and solar over natural gas because they would save taxpayers $168 million. There's entire towns in Texas that are going 100% green to save money. We can talk about that. That's awesome. We can talk about how pay-as-you-go solar is revolutionizing sub-Saharan Africa, where many of the people live who do not have access to electricity. We can talk about how amazing things are happening in India and China. We can talk about how even though the United States is pulling out of the Paris Agreement, the number of cities, states, businesses, and investors who are still in on Paris represent 40% of the population and 30% of the economy. That's pretty amazing. We can talk about who we are and who you are too. We are exactly the right person to care about climate change. Why? Because we're human? Because we live on this planet? Because we care about other people? because we want a safe world to live in, clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, enough food to eat. We want our children to grow up in a world that was safer than our world. We are exactly the right person to care, no matter who we are. And it's not that this should be on our priority list or we should move it up. The reason we care about climate change is because it affects everything that is already on our priority lists. That's why we care. So I'm gonna leave you with this final thought, the idea that caring about God's creation about the people and the other living things that are already being affected by climate change today, it is not somehow in opposition to being a Christian. It is not even something that we should do other. It is something that is actually profoundly part of who we are. It's a genuine expression of our faith. It is a faithful acceptance of our responsibility and most of all, it is a true expression of the love which we ourselves have been blessed with. In the words of my favorite scientist, Jane Goodall, it is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential. Thank you. Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do have a well-earned rest for a minute. We're going to have a short break, uh, just between five and ten minutes, 
chance for you to stretch your legs, talk about what you've just heard to the person next to you, think of a question, pop over and get a drink, pop down to the loo, come and have a look at the resources here. Uh, but please be back in your seat uh, within 10 minutes, and we'll start again with a chance to ask some questions. <laughs>